This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium blockchain network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. To learn more, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Sonny Yaku. Hey, Sonny, how's it going? Going well, how about you? Yeah, pretty good. It's, it's been a while since we've done this together. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think Enigma was the last one. Uh, but yeah, yeah you've, you've, done, you've done some great episodes. Since I was, uh, congratulations on the Coil episode. It was terrific. I, I, oh, thank you. I listened to it twice. That's how good it was. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so today we're speaking with um, Nick Sullivan. And Nick Sullivan is the head of cryptography at Cloudflare. Now, Cloudflare is not you know one of your typical companies that we... You usually cover on the podcast. Uh, it's, it's more of a traditional internet company, but they're doing some like really, really interesting stuff with cryptography that I really wasn't quite aware of uh, before like, uh, recording this podcast. Yeah, and they're like doing a lot to like, especially like help bring like a lot of like decentralization technologies like Tor and IPFS and whatnot to like sort of the masses. Like, you know, a lot of like, Blockchain companies are like, you know, building really cool tech, but like, it's really hard to get this stuff into the hands of like everyday users. And, you know, Cloudflare is really like making this, a lot of this stuff a lot more accessible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think just the fact that a company like Cloudflare is is writing you know, blog posts, you know, quite like long and detailed blog posts about what is IPFS and how they're using it. And, you know, these posts are read by, you know, probably tens of thousands of people uh, outside of the crypto space is, is great for the ecosystem, I think. Um, and yeah, Nick, Nick was a great, uh, great, ho- uh, great guest, uh, very articulate. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really am a huge fan of like, I've always been a huge fan of like pro- uh, decentralization projects that aren't necessarily like blockchain focused. And so Cloudflare has been working a lot with uh, Tor and IPFS, which like, you know, really excited me. Yeah, so we hope you, you'll enjoy this uh, this episode with Nick. And we do have a couple of announcements. Uh, so I think in the last episode I was on, uh, I mentioned that I'll be at the Hyperledger Global Forum. It is from the 12th to the 15th. I'll be there on the 12th and the 13th. And I have the discount code now. And so if you're interested in attending, it is in Basel, Switzerland. It's in Brian's hometown and Mayor's old city where he used to live. Um, I've never been there, so I'm excited. Uh, if there's a discount code for 15%, it is HGF18NEWS. So HGF18NEWS, uh, you can go to the uh, events page. If you if you search for Hyperledger Global Forum, you'll find it. And if you can't uh, remember this discount code, um, we tweeted it a few days ago. So you can see it. Uh, yeah, it was tweeted on... Uh, on the 23rd of November. So you can always go back to our Twitter feed and, and see it. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, if you're there, come say hi. Uh, I'd be glad to, say, to see you. And uh, Sunny, you mentioned you were also attending some events. Yeah. So uh, next month, uh, December 11th, uh, there's a, uh, a company called Dora Hacks, which has hosted a bunch of like really cool blockchain hackathons uh, throughout the world uh, in, in uh, China and in Berlin and uh, in Toronto. Uh, and so they're actually holding their first uh, event here in SF on December 11th. Um, it's completely free to anyone to attend. Uh, I will be speaking and mentoring at this event. So if you want to come hack with me on some cool stuff, uh, uh, definitely check it out. Uh, it's free and just uh, look it up on Eventbrite, Dora Hacks SF. I, I got a question for you. I've never attended a hackathon. Mm-hmm. What, would you, what would you suggest like for some? I mean, I'm quite technically like I, I, I know how to code. I, I don't code like every day anymore, but, uh, you know, at, at some point in my life, I was like a front end developer and I have some experience with stuff like node. Um, my smart contract development skills are you know, near zero, <laughs> but, um, you know, practically speaking, uh, you know, if, if I'm interested in like learning how to do things is, is a hackathon a good place to, to sort of like, just, you know, jump in both feet first or uh, is is that not recommended for someone like me? I would say that there's usually like often like two classes of people who attend hackathons. There's people who are there to like, you know, to go win, like they want to build a cool project and end up with something at the end of the, at the end of the, the weekend and like actually, like, you know, 
or there's often people who are there just to like learn something. And, you know, I've, I've worn both hats throughout my hackathon career, if you will. Uh, and so, you know, some, so sometimes like, you know, I go in with a project I really want to build and I'm like, I want to get this done in this weekend. And so I'll do that. Uh, but then there's sometimes where it's like, you know, I just want to like learn a new piece of technology. And so I just like try to choose like a very, very simple product project. And that's like, and honestly, like when you were at hackathons, like when you're experimenting a new technology, like anyone who's done this before, you know, that like half the time get, goes into just like installing the software, which is, you know, right. not, not, not fun, <laughs> but um, yeah, definitely like, you know, look at, uh, check out like tutorials and like, you know, I would I would say like spend a lot of the hackathon instead of like building the product first spend like half the first half almost like going through tutorials and then the second half if you're feeling comfortable then start start to like try to work on a project uh, directly um, yeah right okay so it, it may be a, like a good uh, exercise to like properly take some time and go do some tutorials around people that can perhaps mentor you and this sort of thing yeah. so a, a good opportunity to learn. If you're not going to build like a proper project, and one of the like you know at hackathons, there's often a lot of mentors there, and I think that's honestly sometimes one of like the most underused like amenities that hackathons offer. So definitely talk to the mentors, and then also um, you know especially when I'm doing one of like the more learning style, uh, I really like to not show up with a team, and I really I really like to like get to the hackathon and like find new people there to work with. It it, it just makes it a much more fun experience in my opinion. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for the tips. I'll. Um, I think maybe I'll look out for some hackathons to attend then. <laughs> sure. All right. So uh, without further ado, here's um, here's Nick Sullivan of uh, Cloudflare. Hi. Right, so we're here today with Nick Sullivan, who's head of cryptography at Cloudflare. Uh, Nick, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're really excited about the show. Uh, when when I found out that uh, the Cloudflare was sort of you know dabbling with. Uh, IPFS, it, it, it led me to like do a bit more research about what you guys were doing in the area of cryptography. And it turns out that you guys are doing a lot of really, really cool and interesting stuff. Uh, and, and I'm always really fascinated when like companies in the more traditional web uh, space, you know, sort of intersect with like companies that we're more familiar with in the blockchain space and you know, projects and companies like in the sense of IPFS. And so that's why I was really, really happy to have you on. So let's maybe start off by uh, talking a bit about your background and you know, how you got involved in cryptography and how you landed it as a head of cryptography at Cloudflare. Sure. Well, um, I have always been interested in math and mathematics and solving problems and puzzles and uh, cryptography in general. Uh, so uh, when I went to school in Canada at University of Waterloo, I did a pure math degree and uh, was really kind of enthralled by uh, the abstract notion of, you know, taking, understanding the, the mathematical world, understanding how objects fit together, how prime numbers worked, how you could, you could take something like uh, as simple as, 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 you know, two and three and five and seven, and, and you have these sort of infinite number of interesting problems and challenges to, to, to go through to, to discover this. And uh, after I did a, a master's degree in cryptography, uh, I got into the computer security world and uh, worked for a little bit at Symantec. I wrote some uh, documents basically on the internet, internet security in general. They have this thing called the Internet Security Threat Report that um, kind of helped analyze what's going on online. online. So uh, my kind of two passions were the internet and understanding you know, what people are doing in this really kind of amazing interconnected network that we all uh, enjoy as the internet and, and cryptography, which is uh, this, the science of secret information. And so after, um, after leaving Symantec, I joined Apple, where I worked uh, on a lot of some sort of secret cryptography <laughs> related uh, <laughs> efforts for about six years or so. And uh, eventually I learned about this company called Cloudflare, which was um, a very young startup at the time, but uh, was doing some really interesting things. For example, um, they had withstood what was at the time the largest distributed denial of service in history. And so uh, a lot of what Cloudflare was doing was really interesting to me because uh, they were offering a free service to help uh, accelerate the web 
as well as protect it from threats. And they're kind of kind of at the center of of everything that was going on all, online. So um, when I joined cryptography, I was the first kind of security engineering focused person at at the company, and uh, I've been here for about five and a half years, um, growing the team. The, the company has grown tremendously since then. We're now, um, you know, a, a big startup, if you will, uh, still a private company. But um, so uh, I started the cryptography team at Cloudflare in order to uh, use this really interesting tool, which is um, cryptography, encryption, hash functions, uh, all, all this sort of really cool math science that, that lets you protect information online as well as um, provide properties like integrity and non-repudiation. And uh, I, I started building a team to, to help take cryptography and apply it to some of the, the bigger problems that Cloudflare was facing and um, to basically spearhead new research in this area. And so this is what I've been doing ever since. So when you were in college uh, studying or university, uh, as us Canadians uh, say, and studying cryptography in Waterloo and, and in your, you know, you know, getting into the, uh, your, your career, did you have any idea that like cryptography would become such an important thing like today? Uh, I mean, just, just if you think of blockchains, uh, it's such a central, it plays such a central role in the functioning of that technology and also just generally the web. Did you, do you think that this was something that would become so massively important uh, for the world? Well, it's very hard to hard to see what happened, right? Uh, hard to predict what happened. Like, for example, uh, my thesis was on elliptic curve cryptography, which at the time was barely barely ever used for anything in production. It was sort of uh, you could you could use SSL for your website, right? You'd you'd have encryption for your website, but everything that people were using was based on Diffie-Hellman and RSA, which were the, the two standard algorithms developed in the 70s. And elliptic curves were this kind of new thing. And now this is actually the fundamental glue that holds together Bitcoin, as well as Ethereum. And, you know, um, and it's also the, the most fundamental cryptography for protecting information online when you're browsing the internet. So um, it was very hard to see <laughs> at the time that, you know, the, this interest of mine would become one of the one of the key technologies to enable technology in the 21st century. Could you like give us a little bit of a brief lowdown on like what Cloudflare is overall? Uh, you know, it's like you know it's not a traditional blockchain company. So some of our listeners, I'm sure, have like heard of Cloudflare, but maybe uh, don't know quite exactly what they do. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively young company actually, right? Like I think only nine years, and like somehow it's grown to become this like almost like centerpiece, like very integral part of the entire like web infrastructure. So could you tell us a little bit about what are the different kind of things Cloudflare is working on and whatnot? Sure. Yes. Well, Cloudflare is a internet security and performance company. Uh, the mission of Cloudflare is to help build a better internet. And that's really what we're trying to do is uh, folks who operate websites and who operate web services and who uh, offer services online, um, whether you're sort of a small, the smallest sort of individual hosting your own blog to a very large corporation, um, a large enterprise that has, you know, massive, massive sets of customers and, you know, uh, very, very high requirements. What Cloudflare does is just help make your site or your, your property faster, more secure, more available, and to give you insights. So uh, the way that Cloudflare does this is uh, using, I guess, the, the two main traditional protocols on the internet, HTTP or HTTPS, for the encrypted version, and DNS. So um, Cloudflare has data centers uh, distributed all around the world, over 150. I don't have the exact number now, but um, in basically every continent except for uh, Antarctica. And so the way it works is if you sign up for Cloudflare, um, rather than visitors to your site going directly to your site, which could have to you know travel across the entire world, which due to speed of light considerations can actually, you know, slow things down. Um, you connect to the nearest Cloudflare location. And if we have, if you have sort of static content on your site, we can serve it directly from there. So um, uh, we can also apply rules. So uh, rules to protect against different types of attacks. So if you think of people doing SQL injections or cross-site scripting attacks or all, all these sort of web security 
certain things, um, by being able to inspect the traffic, we can block these attacks. And um, the, the part that's closer to, to, to my responsibilities is that we also can provide encryption. So um, in the early days of the web and, and some of the, the more challenging things that a web administrator has to do is set up encryption and encryption security for your website. So to move from HTTP to HTTPS, you have to buy a certificate or get a certificate issued and you know manage the configuration and and do these sort of things that are that are a little tricky. And Cloudflare makes that kind of dead simple and, and handles it on your behalf. So um, Cloudflare as a service has grown tremendously. And one of the reasons for that is that we offer um, a free service. So there's over 11 million domains or so that use Cloudflare's free service, which is probably why so many people have heard of it. And so, uh, yeah, you can sign up for Cloudflare and get, you know, denial of service protection. So if someone's trying to knock you off the internet, um, we'll sit in front, right? And we can see the bad traffic and we can kind of keep you online while other people are trying to, to take you off. And uh, so it's, uh, it it's great because having all of these different customers gives us a visibility into what's really happening on the internet. And uh, we take what we see from the genera general set of customers. And and, and uh, if you see an attack against one customer, you can use it to protect other people. So it's a, it, it's a real, it's a real center of the internet kind of thing where it, things go through us and we learn about it and we, we help make the internet better. And uh, uh, we're not only involved in just providing this uh, service, we're also, we really care about making the internet scale going forward and to make, make the, making the internet better. So we're involved in standards, for example, uh, TLS 1.3, which is the recent encryption standard for, for websites. We were closely involved with that. And, um, and my team, we do a lot of research on the cryptography side to see uh, what new ways we can, we can change things so that in the future, uh, using the internet is safer, more secure, faster than it is today. And are you using your own dark fiber between data centers? No, we use the uh, we use the internet, which is why we we rely on strong encryption uh, okay. so, so much. So uh, every one of Cloudflare's data centers is independent, and uh, it's, I, I guess you could say technically decentralized, um, uh, although administratively centralized. And uh, we communicate over the internet over um, different interconnections with different networks. So Cloudflare is actually the most connected network on the internet. We have more peering sessions with other networks than, than anybody else online. Yes, I, I, we use Cloudflare on our website and I, I, we use the, the paid service and I also use it on some other websites like the free service. And I, I kind of see Cloudflare as this like, nice blanket of security but that also provides like a bunch of optimizations like it, it serves your css and your javascript super fast and your html and and it has these like built-in you know like this built-in fortress like that you can call upon at will if you're if you're being attacked that you know sort of like come into action like if certain rules are being um are being triggered so yeah it's, it's a it's a really great service and like no wonder that a lot of people are using it uh, and, and it does show up in a lot of places on the internet. I mean, you very often see Cloudflare landing pages and like CAPTCHA landing pages quite a bit online. So we'll, we'll come back to the CAPTCHA thing a bit later. But in September, uh, uh, you and, and some, some colleagues of yours uh, wrote a series of blog posts, and we'll link to these in the show notes. And I strongly encourage anybody listening to this to check out these blog posts because they're really terrific. So it, it's called uh, Crypto Week. So welcome to Crypto Week, in which... You, you describe sort of all the different things that Cloudflare is doing with crypto, with like sort of innovative stuff, right? So like with IPFS, with regards to Tor, uh, with like DNSSEC. And reading these blog posts, I was like, these, these are great primers for anybody that's really looking to understand fundamentally how this stuff works. Like how does a DNS, like how does your HTTP request function? Like when you call a website, what, who are the different uh, uh, parties at play here? Where are the trust uh, points? You know, where are the vulnerabilities? And how is Cloudflare doing it better? So I thought these these posts were really terrific. But in in this post, you mentioned sort of the trust relationships that one has to um, engage in when using the internet. So whether that's like visiting a website or you know chatting online or like using social media. What are your thoughts about 
how we trust the internet sort of at a broad scale. Do you think most people have a, a, a good understanding of where the trust points are on the internet? And, and, if, and if not, how can, how can companies like Cloudflare like help make that better? Yeah, so I would say in general, people don't understand the trust relationships online. Um, you enter in a website and you go to that website and it comes to you. Uh, you, you enter in a host name or a URL and it goes to you. You click on a link or open an app and you just get content. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting things that go on behind the scenes. And um, a lot of these have to do with trust and trusting and, uh, and actually the implicit trust that is built into the technology that you're using to browse the internet um, to, to show you what you expect and to make sure that what you're getting is something that you're intending to get. And so um, there are a lot of parties that are involved in this. And uh, some of the very obvious ones are um, registrars. So a registrar is a company that you use to buy a domain name. And so if you, uh, if you, if you buy google.com or mysite.com, then you have a registrar and you, you kind of work with this registrar um, to to make sure that your website is advertised and um, your web re registrar is connected to a DNS provider. And so uh, when you type in cloudflare.com into your browser behind the scenes, uh, you have to know what IP addresses cloudflare.com is on. So uh, there's this entire system called DNS, which is a name system, which, um, which is uh, managed by a lot of different en entities around. It's sort of one of the first decentralized systems or I guess hierarchical uh, s systems out there. So you have to look at where who.com is and then .com tells you who example.com is. And then uh, you talk to example.com and then it'll tell you what IP address um, it, it, you actually use to connect to, to example.com. So um, from just a, just a names to numbers perspective, the internet is, is based on IP addresses, your numbers. DNS is kind of the phone book that goes from your name to to a number. Other pieces that you have to have to trust um, involved when you're doing encrypted connections. So if you're going to a, an HTTPS version of a site, um, that site has a cryptographic key, and uh, the, it, this is embedded into a certificate. And so they present you a certificate, and you do this sort of handshake, and then you have a, a secure channel. And so one of the things that your browser has to do is know how to trust which certificates correspond to which websites. And this is a, another system, another sort of system of different organizations that make up something called the public key infrastructure. And so your browser trusts a bunch of certificate authorities who are the only ones that are allowed to mint certificates for different host names. And so this system has been around since the 90s. And uh, there's been some problems with it over time. Um, certificate authorities have been compromised, and that's put a lot of people at risk. Um, certificates themselves uh, need to have an, an expiration period, or else you know, certificates from the 1990s using old cryptography that's been broken would still be valid. So um, there's, there's a lot of challenges with, with trusting this. And, and, uh, and we don't even need, <laughs> we can't even go into this even more, but um, but even at the lower layers of the internet, IP addresses, the internet is a set of you know hundreds of thousands of interconnected networks that have to actually exchange data. So um, when you when you're one network and you say, hey, this IP address two dot two dot two dot two or one two three four belongs to me, then well, you need to be authority. You need to actually you know trust that. When someone says, yeah, you know, send that traffic to me, that it actually belongs to you. So there's there's multiple different layers, and and uh, the, the intro blog post really goes into this in, in depth. And so um, as, a, as a general user, all of this is happening behind the scenes, and, uh, and you really have to trust it. There's, you know, there's the very minimal thing that you have in browsers, which is that padlock, which does imply some things. It implies that you know the certificate is that you're getting is valid for the site, and this is the site that you that you're trying to go to. But um, there's a lot of threats out there, and there's a lot of ways that people try to manipulate this and hijack this, and you know steal people's traffic. But um, generally, 
Uh, this is not a, a, a well understood thing by the by the public. So companies like Cloudflare are investing in various technologies uh, that you know help simplify this for folks, like help make it so that uh, if we are connecting with other entities around around the internet, that we can trust them, and um, we have to agree on protocols to do this and define these protocols and implement them and get everyone to kind of agree on standards, and so. That's that's one of the that's one of the interesting organizational challenges and uh, uh, inter organizational challenges that that we have to deal with right now. But um, luckily, for our security and for for people's privacy online, is that there are a lot of organizations who do care about this and who uh, you know are impacted when malicious things happen. So uh, companies like Cloudflare and others are are working to help improve the situation. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise-grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. A lot of these authorities that you mentioned, like, you know, uh, for example, the certificate authorities or, you know, you mentioned DNS is like a hierarchical system. Uh, where do these where did these authorities come from? Like sort of who decided them and like you know, was it just happened to be like all the companies who were around like back in the 80s, like they just happened to like be grandfathered in or how, how, did, how does that process work? Well, yeah, the Internet has <laughs> evolved over the years in various different ways. And, uh, you know, it originally like, we can go into like the origins of the Internet as a DARPA project and and um, the <laughs> the switch to TCP IP in the 80s and the uh, the evolution of the DNS. But. Uh, it, it's really sort of happened organically over time, and then some organizational um, bodies have been put in place to help guide this. And uh, so, for example, Internet Protocols, there's a, a vo volunteer group called the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. So if you've heard about RFCs, uh, when people say, oh, RFC, whatever, whatever, this is a certain protocol. Like DNS is, is a set of RFCs. That's what the IETF does. Um, there's IANA, which is an organization that uh, is associated with un with managing names and numbers, and they have lots of processes around that. There's ICANN. There's uh, there's the set of regional registries. So there's uh, the entire IP space. North America has a group called ARIN, and they distribute out the IPs to different organizations by different bids. So these these are often um, organizations that are a mix of profit, nonprofit, but uh, generally have a mandate to um, be good stewards for the internet and to to make sure that this is this technology that we all rely on is something that um, is available for everyone in the world that enables kind of equal access and that you know continues to to grow in terms of having both commercial and non-commercial uses. So one thing I find interesting is. Often when people are talking about like cryptography slash blockchain things, there seems to often be like three somewhat independent goals that often get like correlated together, but I think actually should often be thought of as somewhat independent. And I think the three here, what I see is like privacy, uh, security, and like decentralization. And the third one, decentralization is just like very vague kind of concept that came up in the last few years along with the blockchain space. 
And so, you know, reading through your blog, through your blog post uh, on the Welcome to Crypto Week, you talk about like, you know, a lot of the stuff about like the immutability that IPFS provides, which kind of goes along with security. Uh, you talk about the privacy that uh, Tor provides, um, but not too much talk about like decentralization. And so, you know, would that be a fair characteristic to say that like when you guys are approaching this like cryptography on the Internet, you guys are really much more focused? Like, almost like you're willing to accept this, like these like authorities and centralization that exists on the internet, but are trying to focus primarily on improve and almost, you know, like kind of becoming one of the central authorities on the internet, uh, but really trying to focus on pushing the security and privacy side of things. Would that be like a fair characterization? Well, I, I would say that Cloudflare is trying to serve its customers and Cloudflare's customers are not only websites and web services that use Cloudflare, but uh, you, you think of the users of the internet as a whole. And if the internet becomes more functional, and if people are happier online and are more likely to um, to, to do business online, then then it leads to the growth of the entire industry. So, uh, security is one of the one of the very 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 most important things for the company. Is um, if you get hacked, or somebody steals data from your website, or someone tries to mess around with your users, uh, this is going to impact trust and it's going to impact the bottom line for a bunch of businesses and uh and same with privacy if you if you think of how people are really waking up to privacy online and you know what you share and what the motivations of organizations that are based on monetizing individuals actions online have done and how that how that's grown i think it's it's a it's another really big um really big salient thing to humans. So security and privacy, I think, are things that human beings understand and relate to and businesses understand. Decentralization um, is, is it's more of, a, more of a second order goal, right? I mean, if you don't have decentralization, you have these, if you have, if you have sort of fully centralized systems, you have these really, really inherent risks to, uh, to, to your system. So it, if you sort of think back to the mid 20th century, uh, the telephone system in the United States, there was a uh, Bell had this massive monopoly over um, over over the way that communications, telecommunications happened. And that le led to a lot of really fascinating and amazing innovations. You think of the transistor, um, uh, like a lot of radio communications and, and all, all the sorts of amazing things that they they created and they actually did connect everybody online, but um, but until Bell was broken up, we didn't have this uh, this ability for all of these internet companies to to kind of come out of nowhere and be able to to compete with each other. So you have centralization, and I guess if you think of, in the corporate terms, monopolies are uh, are are ways to <laughs> ways to kind of build wealth and, and make something really good, but it also leads to the ability, uh, the tendency to kind of abuse, uh, the, abuse power. And uh, having a diversity of participants, a diversity of views, and a diversity of um, components in a system, uh, and I guess decentralization is one component of that, is, is I guess a result of having a lot of different participants, is, is something that actually really helps innovation, helps competition, and helps things grow. So it's it's less relevant to individual customers and people, but I but it's it is a second order goal and it is something that that we think about as well. And uh, when when talking about the cloud computing space and how people are running services, uh, we we do worry about um, companies that are kind of massive central points of lock in, right? I mean if you, you think of um, the AWS reInvent conference is going on this this year. It's the largest trade conference in the United States, and uh, that's that's a company that you know wants everybody to put all of their computing workloads onto a single company. And there's there's a lot of lock-in associated with that. So um, I, I think from a cryptography perspective, decentralization is important. But I think also from a business perspective, having uh, a, a lot of different options is important for a healthy ecosystem. Yeah, th there's a thing that you might be familiar with, which is Zuko's Triangle. Zuko, Wilcox O'Hearn, the founder of Zcash. Yep. Uh, and Zuko's Triangle is like you have security, uh, decentralization, and human-readable names. And I think there's a lot of overlap with 
with this question here where I think like I think user experience also plays a big role uh, or should be considered in, in like how we build systems. And so if you have a system that's like secure and, and um, uh, you know, easy to use, but where you don't have this robustness, which uh, is you know, it's meant to be brought on by the centralization, then really, you know, you, you might have to choose between two of those you know, three points on the triangle. Uh, I don't know if you know, someone will actually solve that. But it seems difficult. Yeah, it is difficult, and there are there are trade offs in that you can make in any one of these little corners, and uh, and finding the right ones are finding the right trade offs are hard to do. But um, uh, considering where we are as a status quo, there's there's always improvements to be made to um, try to you know square Zuko's triangle, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> so let's move on to the the core topic today. What we want to bring you on to, to discuss, and that's IPFS. So uh, within this uh, Crypto Week uh, series of blog posts, there was uh, two blog posts about IPFS, one that sort of explained uh, what IPFS is for the, for the, the, you know, the, the average person who doesn't you know, necessarily know about IPFS, and, and another post that uh, described this experiment which was based on this concept of end-to-end integrity. Uh, so could you, could you describe like, why is Cloudflare exp- experimenting with the, with the IPFS and um, what, what you guys what are you guys doing here? Yeah, so I think one of the important things that Cloudflare is trying to do is to, well, as I mentioned, make the internet better. But one of the aspects of this is connecting users of the web to uh, some of these new networks that have values and have properties that the, the w- current web doesn't have. And IPFS is one of them. Um, as a content addressed network, uh, every piece of content has a hash as a specific unique fingerprint associated with it. And unlike the web where you look things up via names with IPFS, you can look things up via a fingerprint of what they are. And so um, the the traditional web is 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 not necessarily immutable. You, you have um, different things that can happen. You have a lot of very dynamic web pages and you, um, you have services like Cloudflare that can see and detect things going wrong and sort of modify and optimize things on the fly, um, which is great. But uh, with IPFS, there are certain use cases that people have for this where it, they, they just want things to absolutely be guaranteed that you're getting exactly what you were sent. And uh, if you think of things like package managers or um, image sharing or things like this, uh, where you, you have something that's static that's never going to change, uh, then IPFS makes a lot of sense. So uh, the IPFS gateway though is is the I guess the first of what we're calling the distributed web gateway, which is uh, a way to access IPFS as a network through HTTP. And so uh, people have web browsers. People don't necessarily, um, on I guess the broadest sense, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of experts and 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 people who are interested in the space who are really keen on on these decentralized networks who run nodes and and are happy to do these sort of things. But um, the general populace um, has a web browser and they know how to how to use a web browser. And so what this gateway does is allows people with web browsers to you know, connect directly to IPFS. And um, because IPFS is static, um, Cloudflare is a really, really great service for that because we can do caching. We can keep copies of data really close to people. We can distribute uh, data all around the world. And so um, you mentioned the experiment that we did, which is um, a browser plugin uh, for end-to-end integrity. Uh, I guess one of the, the purists complaint about having a gateway to something like IPFS is that as a, as a question is, you know, what if the gateway changes the value? I mean, the, the value of, or changes the content and the value of IPFS uh, is in the fact that it's content addressed. So uh, if you build a website, it's guaranteed to be the same for every single person who sees it. There's no censorship. There's nothing like that. Um, it's, it's just, you publish one thing once and then it becomes, you know, there in the universe forever. And this is why it's called the interplanetary file system, or one of the reasons is that, you know, publish something once, it's available at all times. And if you have a gateway, HTTP is, as I mentioned, it's not 
really based on this end-to-end -end integrity concept. But um, with an IPFS gateway, you can put the hash as part of the URL. And with this extension, uh, you actually can validate that that hash in the URL matches the, the hash that you expect. And uh, the way that it's actually chained into, way that it's actually chained together is with DNS. So if you have a, have a website, you can say, in, in the typical sense, you have, here's my host name, and it gives you an IP address, and that gives you the address. So this is, this is about routing. Um, with our IPFS experiment, you have, this is the host name. This is the hash that represents the content on this website. And so what the browser extension does is it just valid, makes sure that you know, what you're seeing on the site matches exactly what was published in the DNS. And um, it kind of ties in with our with our other efforts of the week, especially DNSSEC, which is just uh, signatures in the DN in the DNS itself. So, um, if you trust the DNS and you trust the DNS central authority, then this is a way to, you know, put D put IPFS into an existing system to help kind of um, uh, validate the integrity from within the browser. How has like the adoption been of this uh, Cloudflare like uh, IPFS? C you know you can almost consider like IPFS as a CDN of sorts, like a content delivery network. And so, have you seen that like Cloudflare's offering has like helped increase the adoption? Because you know I actually tried to put my website onto IPFS. Uh, it's been a while actually; it's been probably over a year now. So the technology is probably a little bit more immature, uh, and you know I had a quite a hard time doing so. And so, uh, like, you know, you guys have built a lot of the tooling to make this easier and stuff. Um, how has been, like, the public reception and stuff to this? Yeah, I think people are really excited about the IPFS gateway. Uh, and they're really excited because of the possibilities that, that it unlocks. And uh, the content hosting side on IPFS, I, I agree, it's, it's relatively immature. So uh, if you want to host something on IPFS, you can, you know, host it from your 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 local laptop or you can use one of these services that's a pinning pinning service but um but yeah the, the the publishing side of it i think needs needs some some development but um actually integrating the access side is is where the gateway really shines so um we've we've seen all sorts of different customers or websites or properties or that that really you know believe in decentralization and believe in um having a source of truth for the, their data that is distributed beyond their own data centers. This is actually good for things like disaster recovery. Um, uh, and they need a way to, to bootstrap their app or they need a way to bootstrap their, their application. And like the fundamental, you know, belief is that, you know, we want to build this in a distributed way, but we don't necessarily, you know, it, one of the, the drawbacks of IPFS as it is, is, is it's relatively slow to actually get content. And so um, having this gateway is a way to, to, to speed things up. You get all the benefits of Cloudflare in front of um, this network that you have integrity protection and you have uh, decentralization. So it, it's, it's been coming up. We've, we've definitely seen a lot more adoption since, since uh, we launched this several months ago. And, um, and it, not just from the, the, distributed application space, but also from more traditional companies as well that have have uh, have an interest in decentralization. So if I could just sort of rephrase what, what you guys are doing here, because there's different components, I think, that uh, need to be separated out. So yeah. the first is uh, uh, an IPFS gateway. And there are tons of IPFS gateways out there. And I think most of our listeners are probably familiar with them. So there are these websites that you, you go to this URL, so example-gateway.com. Com, I think is one of them. You go to this website, you 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 pop in a um, you just add the 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 IPFS hash to the URL, and it serves like this gateway is in the back end connected to an IPFS node, and it is serving to you the content on the IPFS network. And the, and the vulnerability here is that you know perhaps this website is is uh, sort of doing a man in the middle type of attack where it's serving you another piece of content than the one that you initially requested. And you have really no way of doing, knowing that unless like you, you know, do like an MB5 or like verify the hash of the content once you've downloaded it, that it verifies that it matches with the hash of the address. 
Um, yep, that's right. But what you guys are doing is like a step beyond that. You're actually putting one of those gateways in the Cloudflare sort of wrapper. Um, so all the IPFS, all the content on IPFS is now available super fast in one of these 150 data centers that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's right. So that's the, uh, the, the Cloudflare IPFS gateway is, yeah, it's like you take any typical gateway and then you Cloudflareify it. Okay. Uh, so, so, so that's great because all of a sudden you have this really fast content network, this content delivery network that's serving up IPFS content. And it, it's kind of similar, I guess, like it reminds me of this project we had a few weeks ago called BloxRoute, which is like content delivery networks for blockchains. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of similar to that. But then the issue with that is that if you're using it and you know, maybe you trust example gateway.com uh, because you know some nice crypto person's hosting it or I don't know, someone you may meet at a conference is hosting it. You might trust that person. Uh, but the, the issue here is that people might, might not trust Cloudflare or at least Cloudflare would like to prove that the content that they're delivering to you is actually the content that you requested. So what you build here is, is, is a browser plugin that checks the IPFS network and makes sure that that content matches the hash that you uh, requested. Well, more specifically, it checks that the ha if you're using the Cloudflare gateway as, you know, cloudflare-ipfs.com slash your hash value, it checks the value of the content against that hash. Um, the the really, really cool part that I didn't actually go into detail, but... Um, so just, sorry, so it checks the value of the content against the hash. So it does this in the browser. It, there's no like... Browser. Right. It doesn't sort of like go and do an IPFS request, you know, a, a parallel request to verify. It, it checks the hash and it does sort of the, crypto, uh, the hashing algorithm internally and, and verifies that it matches. It's kind of like doing an, MD, an MD5 verification. It's it's uh, it's like MD5, but a uh, better hash function. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. MD5 okay. is, is a little breakable right now. But the other really cool thing that you can do with Cloudflare's gateway is bring your own host name. So rather than have cloudflare-ipfs.com slash whatever, you can just have, you know, mywebsite.com and you just say mywebsite.com is on IPFS. Here's the hash of the root file of my website. Okay, so this is the third thing I want to talk about. So, so there's, the, there's the, the gateway, there's the verification tool, but then what wraps this together is saying, okay, now as a Cloudflare user, as someone who has a website hosted on Cloudflare, like, like Epicenter, for instance, well, you can, you, can, you can set this thing up on your website or in your Cloudflare account that tells Cloudflare index my, like, you guys are running an IPFS node and and it creates um, basically a, a copy of your website and all the web pages on your website, static content on this IPFS node that is now available to the entire IPFS ecosystem. Yeah, it's it's sort of like that. It's more It's more that you have to put your content onto IPFS some way and if someone tries to access your website through Cloudflare, we will fetch it from IPFS. So uh, Cloudflare, as a service, doesn't host content. And, and this, is, this is sort of a very important key part of what Cloudflare does, is we cache content. And so we need a, a place, there's sort of some root of source of truth. And so if you're going to use this service, you can run a local node on your computer and say, I'm going to host from here. And we will grab it from there. We'll keep a copy around as long as we can. And, uh, and and serve it from Cloudflare's cache. Uh, alternatively, you could pay a service to keep a copy of your content on, on IPFS, and that's that's the host. And then Cloudflare just goes onto IPFS, fetches your content, puts it around the world, and anybody who wants it can can get it through us. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. We're not actually hosting things on IPFS. Although, if you fetch something through IPFS, um, our node will have a copy of it. So it actually uh, helps uh, improve the, the, the duplication of content in an IPFS, which is really important because if there's only one copy of your content in the IPFS network, then uh, it, if that, that copy goes offline, then you know, the content's no longer available. And so essentially what you guys have done is you know, allowed for that third part of this like project, it you kind of allowed the uh, IPFS to almost integrate well with the existing DNS system, right? So I can now like 
I can have my website accessible, my IPFS hosted website accessible through like my own personal like domain name, but still going through Cloudflare's like uh, CDN. Yeah, that's right. And um, because we are so good at issuing certificates and kind of managing that, then you also get uh, get encryption for that website. So sort of automatically. How do you like see like the future of like IPFS? Do you see like it being like sort of a complementary service to like H or protocol to HTTP or more it's, it's more competitive? Uh, do you see like you know maybe websites will be served over HTTP, but like certain assets on the website are over IPFS? How do you see this like amalgamation of these two protocols uh, going forward? Uh, it's an it's an interesting question because nobody really knows. Um, the hope is that. You know, IPFS provides a specific niche and a specific uh, property that HTTP doesn't, and that the expectation would be that they would both kind of live in parallel. You can't necessarily do a lot of dynamic stuff with IP IPFS, but um, but the integrity protection that it has and the actual distributed nature of the hosting, um, I th I think makes it useful for specific applications. So I think you'll find applications that are mostly HTTP, applications that are mostly IPFS, and applications that are sort of a, mi a mix of the two. And uh, it, it really depends on how well browsers and other, other, other technologies uh, adopt this. So if you have like a mobile app that has native IPFS support or a mobile SDK that comes out with native IPFS support, then um, Maybe it'll it'll become more popular in apps that that, that would need this. But um, yeah, I, I t tend to see them as complementary. They both have their advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, I, I was I was speaking with uh, Juan Benet at, at Web three. I kind of bumped into him and of asking him about about this very thing. And um, from his perspective, I mean, like browser support is at least partly possible so i guess like uh chromium is supporting it now and like their dev versions and maybe firefox will support it sooner can't remember exactly but it, you know browser support is coming and i was actually quite surprised to see that how how fast that had come i mean when we had him on um i guess it was episode 100 uh, well 163 weeks ago or something like that um i thought this this, this was like years to get integrated in the browsers but it seems like it's moving much faster than yeah, my understanding is that the path that they're taking is first exposing um, IPFS as a first order protocol. So you have HTTP colon slash slash whatever, you could have IPFS colon slash slash whatever. And uh, the transition to, to get there is um, is that if you have IPFS colon slash slash, you can, you can register a plugin that is able to handle that for you. And that's, that's sort of the first step. And then eventually down the line, the IPFS node will potentially be native in the browser. But right yeah. now, it's it's all browser extensions. So what did you learn from this? Well, um, <laughs> I guess we learned a lot. Um, first, that latency is, is really an issue uh, when it comes to user experience. So uh, if you are the first person to ever fetch something through the IPFS gateway, uh, then it has to go back to our node, and then our node has to search on the internet and find it, and then uh, get the copy, and then send it to the cache, and then it, it can eventually take, you know, a long time for um, content to show up. And so, for certain applications, uh, it's the, the user experience is, is is potentially problematic if if you if you don't have a lot of caching and a lot of uh, ability to serve things immediately. Um, the other thing we learned is that you can build some pretty interesting, unexpected applications even on a, a platform that is for essentially for static content as IPFS is as in its current incarnation. Um, so one of the examples that we did with the IPFS gateway is we built a searchable um, mirror of Wikipedia. So uh, you can actually uh, link to this site. It's on IPFS. And uh, you can build essentially search type capabilities into IPFS because a search is essentially a table, which is a static file. And then 
you can you can put JavaScript into there. So you could you can do some really cool interactive things with IPFS. It's not just about serving up static images. It's a it's a fully fledged platform. So I think those those are the two things that that we learned about IPFS. Um, the other thing that we learned is just just the the interest in this area is huge. Um, uh, a lot of people are really trying to figure out how to uh, in, engage with and take advantage of and, you know, have reap the benefits of of new technology uh, and that, that provide that provides new features like uh, ha having having resilience to single uh, to failures is, 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 a, is a big thing. Having integrity and um, and, and people are really in really thinking about trust and uh, hosting websites and hosting web services and, and running things online. Um, it's, it's more and more important for, for people to, to be able to trust what you're doing. And as the infrastructure grows, there's just so many more participants that uh, it, it's hard to, hard to, to actually, you know, implicitly trust everything that you're doing online. So we have to have to build these technical measures and, and uh, there's a lot of interest in this from lots of angles. Cool. So um, one of my favorite stories, actually, regarding like IPFS and gateways um, is I was talking to Jeremy Johnson from uh, Protocol Labs uh, about a year ago, last DevCon, DevCon 3, so November 2017. And this was like right around, like right after like the whole like... Uh, Catalonia and Catalan uh, referendum around uh, independence that was going on. And so what was happening during that uh, process was um, the Spanish government. So, you know, there were a lot of like pro referendum websites, people like websites showing people like how to go vote and like, you know, just like reasons why, like, you know, just general pro uh, websites. And the Spanish government was like sort of censoring these and shutting a lot of them down. And what was really cool was um, IPFS was actually being used to keep some of these websites up. And so people were like hosting them on IPFS. And I thought it was really cool because it was one of like, I don't know, I think one of the first times that like this generation of like de decentralization technologies um, has really been used to like cause like a physical, like a, a tangible impact on like current, on like world, on world politics or whatnot. Um, but then there was something interesting happening where the websites were being hosted on IPFS, but everyone was accessing them through the IPFS.io gateway. And what the Spanish government essentially ended up started doing was actually censoring the IPFS.io uh, uh, gateway. And so now people weren't, and most people weren't even aware of any, uh, any other gateways and people didn't have the software, you know, it's not easy to install the IPFS software. And so it just suddenly became very, um, inaccessible to them. And so this kind of like leads into the um, other one of the other kind of centerpieces of your crypto week that you had was about Tor. And so how do you see this like interesting relationship between IPFS and Tor? And like, what can IPFS gain by being served over Tor? Yeah, so I, I think I think of Tor as in the same family of technologies as IPFS and and a lot of these new blockchain distributed web type technologies because it really is a lot of independent nodes that work together to provide um, a a property that you wouldn't get with a with with the regular web so with tor what it does is it provides you with routing anonymity and it uses a layered encryption approach to do so and um and, and in terms of their trade-offs, um, latency is one that they they just don't really care about. It's actually anonymity is much more important than than getting things quick. So um, the, the the typical web, I mean the, the uh, unencrypted web and, and um, potentially even IPFS, if if you're talking about distributing this content, uh, it's the the opposite of an anonymous, right? You're you're connecting directly with another person and requesting a very specific thing, and they know what you're asking and they know who you are. But but it provides integrity. So you have one network that provides integrity and one network that provides anonymity. Um, then it, it's it sort of makes sense to if you want both, you can kind of put one on top of the other. And uh, what Cloudflare launched during Crypto Week uh, 
was es- essentially a way to access the Tor network. Uh, it's kind of like Cloudflare put an IPFS node into the IPFS network. Cloudflare put a Tor node into the Tor network as well. And this Tor, net- Tor node is, is used to uh, route any traffic to any site that's on Cloudflare. So if you connect through Cloudflare's Tor node, um, which is a, a .onion address, we've got about 10 of them. Um, if you connect to any one of those and make a request for any site that's on Cloudflare, it kind of goes through. And so, um, the uh, yeah, the, the the bottom of the diagram that I think you're you're referencing on on the page shows a user going through Tor, um, and then connecting out the Tor point through Cloudflare, and then to the Cloudflare IPFS gateway, and then to IPFS. So. Uh, I think if you're doing so, you're going to get a very slow connection, but it's going to be very private. Um, even Cloudflare doesn't know who you are, but but you also gain, you know, the the end-to-end integrity properties of, of IPFS. So I think they're pretty cool complementary technologies if you're okay with things being extremely slow. I see. So this whole like onion routing service that uh, you guys built that week, uh, you know, I, I know in like the past year, especially on like Hacker News and stuff, there's a lot of people like to like blame Cloudflare's like uh like especially the recapture features for some sort of like the degradation of the user experience on Tor. Um, I I I always thought that it was a bit of like an unfair blaming, but um, could you explain a little bit of why this whole recapture system is like so necessary in uh the Tor in Tor, and then how your Onion routing service protocol like helps resolve some of those uh, pain points. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, people come to Cloudflare for security, uh, insights, acceleration, things like this. Security is one of the main things. And uh, if you talk to the average webmaster or the uh, person running a website, they actually don't really have a very favorable opinion of Tor because uh, as an anonymity network, it's very easy to send abusive traffic through it and not have to deal with the consequences. So uh, a a lot of the traffic that actually comes through Tor and comes through exit nodes uh, is is attack traffic. And it it hits our web application firewall and we say, what is this? And um, and, and sort of block it. So um, the way that that Cloudflare is currently set up and and we're hoping to improve the system is, uh, is to use something called IP reputation and IP reputation databases to help make a determination as to how likely a, P, a, a, a HTTP request is going to be malicious or not, or a part of a, a flood or not. Is this an attack or not? And so uh, the, what we do is, is we use a captcha to kind of prove that it's a, to, to, to force the user coming through to, to force, to prove that they are a human uh, or at least able to solve one of these um, human interaction puzzles and sort of once they prove that they're a person then we say okay great you can come through do whatever you want with this website but um where you're coming from seems to have a lot of bad requests and so um the kind of danger level gets elevated uh and and this is something that our customers expect is that uh they have to pay for bandwidth they have to pay for um you know what it takes to administer a site and run it and deal with comment spam and and deal with all these sort of things and and you know this ip reputation is a very coarse way of uh of lowering the amount of crap that you get if you will on the site so because of how tor works is that there's there's a couple um there's a small set of computers that are called tor exit nodes where the traffic goes into the tor network and then exit out of those no- exits out of those nodes into um the internet uh, these IPs tend to be given a pretty bad reputation because there's so much bad stuff coming from them. So this is kind of the crux of the reason why people see so many captures while using Tor and why Cloudflare is uh, is sort of being blamed for the degradation of this network. And we, d- we didn't like that. We think that you know, Tor is a valuable tool. Um, we still need to protect our customers from attacks. And, we, and like, these are just... This is this is who we're building the service for, and this is this, these are the people who, you know, we want to use Cloudflare. We still want to give them that service, but we also think that the the secondary effects on the internet as a whole it's it, are are important as well. So um, having more people use an anonymity network, make having people use uh, gain these properties of these alternative networks if they choose to use them, 
and not be punished for it is uh, is something that we're really interested in. So um, what our Tor gateway does is it allows folks who are browsing websites on Tor to uh, actually access Cloudflare websites through, as I mentioned, a, a node that's running in the Tor, Tor network that has an Onion address. And if, I, I guess every time that you connect through the Tor network to an Onion service, you connect through a circuit. So there's an entry node, there's a transit node, there's a third node, and then you then you can connect to the site. So every one of these circuits is unique for every person. Um, and when you run an Onion service, you actually get a circuit ID. So you get to know whether or not two different connections to the same uh, to the s- same service are from two different people, and because of that, you can um, actually apply policies on a very selective basis, right? So, if someone is actually sending a lot of comment spam, then you you can say, you know, this circuit this circuit is bad. We can block this without blocking legitimate people. And I think this is this is one of the one of the great things that we helped uh, put together with this with this, this tour thing. We work with the tour uh, browser team as well to, to help implement this. So if you visit a site that's on Cloudflare, we'll send an HTTP header that says, hey, by the way, if you want to, if you're going to reconnect, we have all these onion addresses and uh, you can just use these and connect through tour instead of connecting through an IP address. And, and this has been very, um, very successful, actually. We, we ha- turned it on for all Cloudflare sites. With with all of this, and I mean, you, so you guys are, it seems like quite quite involved in sort of the open source space. In fact, um, Sunny was mentioning earlier, and I wasn't really aware of this, but that you guys have quite a few crypto libraries that uh, that are open source. In fact, some of them are being used by Ethereum um, and, and a bunch of other websites, like pretty much half the internet is using your crypto libraries. How does this and this experimentation with IPFS and this Tor stuff that you guys are working on, like how does this all fit into like, you know, your business model, is there, are there specific businesses here that you're looking to develop or is it more just sort of being at the cutting edge uh, of these technologies and allowing sort of the, you know, the, the experience of everybody using the web to be improved? Well, it's part of the mission statement of the company, which is to help build a better internet and open source is, is something that's core to, to what we are. I, I think Cloudflare's doesn't necessarily have secret sauce in the software, right? Um, uh, almost everything that we use, we try to open source because it will be usable for for, for other folks online. So, uh, for example, four years ago, we released a library called CFSSL, which was a Go-based certificate authority. And uh, you can use it to you know, build certificates and build a PKI inside your own organization. And it actually got picked up by uh, Let's Encrypt. And now it's the core of the Let's Encrypt certificate authority, as well as, you know, Salesforce and a bunch of other really big companies are are, are using it. And, um, and we've contributed code to the Go standard library. So the um, P256, which is one of the most well uh, commonly used elliptic curves, uh, one of Cloudflare's engineers you know, we optimized it because we do so much cryptography. So, you know, why not share this with the world? And I think it's, it's, um, there's no drawback for everybody having a better version of uh, cryptographic tools. And uh, if, if you have a faster library that's secure and safe, put it out there for people to use. I guess so, so far we've talked a lot about, um, you know, two major decentralization technologies, which is IPFS and Tor. But one that we haven't really talked too much about yet, which is probably one of the you know ones that's the most well known, is blockchains, right? And so um, I was wondering, how do you guys think about uh, blockchains? Uh, you know, I know you have this one uh, protocol you kind of like dubbed uh, clock chains, like as a joke. Uh, but you know, in that one, you're talking about like you know a timing system for like SSL certificates, uh, so you can you know like you know synchronized clocks. Uh, but, you know, another option is I actually worked on a project where like, you know, instead of like doing SSL certificate expire, expiration, you can do a system where like, you know, a public a blockchain acts as a public bulletin board where you like list expire or like uh, compromised uh, signing systems. Um, another use case for I think like blockchains with, within your within the web infrastructure 
is throughout this entire thing, you guys have talked a lot about like using the DNS system, right? So you talked about how you're using DNS for like um, the IPFS like resolution or, um, you know, with the, your, you have this other project called encrypted SNI, which you're trying to basically create like a PKI. Um, and so, you know, you're using the, you're kind of uh, using the DNS system to do that as well. And like we mentioned, um, the D DNS system is a very like hierarchical system. Have you ever thought about uh, maybe exploring the option of using blockchains to do so? Like, you know, so we mentioned Zuko's Triangle as earlier as well. And so, you know, the cool thing about Z so Zuko's Triangle was this whole thing about human readability and uh, decentralization and security. Uh, but Aaron Schwartz actually had this like, you know, he, he actually made this observation that a blockchain actually is a way to get around Zuko's Triangle. And so that kind of led to projects like Namecoin and Handshake and things like this. So I guess my overall question here is like, how do you guys think about like integrating like blockchain technology into some of your offerings or in the just in the general web infrastructure as a whole? Yeah, so I think th there's a there's another kind of trilemma that um, our CEO Matthew Prince put out in a in a blog post about Tor a few years ago about you know <laughs> making things usable, secure, and and having low latency. And I, I think uh, when you're in the web context, uh, this is something that's very underrated: is the ability to get things fast and to get things uh, immediately. And so. Uh, when it comes to certificates and time and uh, a lot of different things, if you're connecting to a website, 100 milliseconds is going to kill you. Um, and so uh, there's there's a number of initiatives that we're interested in that are blockchain-esque, that are um, blockchain, that sort of seem blockchain-esque. Blockchain uh, and one of those is certificate transparency. And so one of the I guess the, one of the main differences here is that uh, in, in a lot of the blockchain technologies that, that we're talking about, it's we're talking about fully trustless decentralized systems where you have a lot of different peers, and then you have to. This is this is why consensus is is so important is uh, being able to have all these different peers and all sort of agree on a specific thing. Um, I think in the web PKI and at least in the web website situation, that's fine, but that's sort of a step too far, or at least it's a step that's uh, a little bigger than the technology is willing to take us right now. So um, a certificate transparency is an example of uh, of one step. So it's, a, it's essentially a hash tree of all the certificates that have ever been issued. And for certificate transparency to work, you need independent groups to uh, manage these, the, these certificates as well. So you, you end up in something that's sort of the analogous of, uh, of like a permission blockchain. And with certificate transparency, you have to, it, you actually don't have to do the lookup on the machine and you don't have to run a node on your machine and you don't have to synchronize with the blockchain. And so um, the cost of latency to a system like this is not big enough to, to, to slow its progress. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the, the main challenge for, integrating web PKI traditional um, web technologies and blockchains is really about uh, being fast and being able to synchronize things fast and being able to transfer data fast and be able to have, have fast uh, consensus. And uh, having a fully trustless system is is not necessarily conducive to that. Although we've seen some some pretty good experimentation experiments in, in that direction. I see. Cool. And Earlier, you had mentioned that this IPFS gateway is just one of the first projects in this larger decentralized web gateway uh, series of projects almost. So, you know, what are, what are some of the other projects that are like you have planned in the sphere of decentralized web? Uh, one that I thought I think it would be really cool was like it would be like, you know, maybe in your Cloudflare DNS, like 1.1.1.1, maybe integrate like Namecoin resolution, I thought would be a really cool idea. But I don't know. What are some of the other ones that you guys are thinking about? So we've talked to the Namecoin folks. We've talked to folks at, at Ethereum. We're we're really kind of testing the waters at this point. And right now we're, we're mostly investing in, you know, how can we make the IPFS gateway better? And that's what the short-term roadmap looks like. But But down the road, there's so many interesting technologies in this space solving different problems and um, 
you sh- shouldn't be surprised to see any one of those pop up down the line. Yeah. So you mentioned one dot one dot one dot one, and so that's a, a basically a, a, a free DNS service that you provide. Um, so it's, I guess similar to like Google DNS or uh, Open DNS, something like that, but but with with privacy apparently. And you, you're, I was reading your website earlier, and I guess KPMG is auditing your servers to make sure that you're not actually like logging anything. And so privacy is sort of a big deal here. I'm curious, like what goes into buying uh, people sort of hear about you know, flipping domain names and paying in, in, in enormous amounts of money for domain names. What goes into buying the IP address that one dot one dot one dot one? Um, <laughs> well, uh, we, we didn't buy one dot one dot one dot one. It's actually, um, uh, I mentioned how there's different, registration the different authorities that manage IP, uh, ips and uh the one space is actually owned by ap nick which is uh the asia pacific region for distributing ips and they they never thought that they would be possible to even give this ip address to anybody because it was so so bad in terms of the amount of garbage traffic that would come to it so um Anybody who's building any sort of test for an IP address in any documentation, it's going to say one 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 one. It's just the simplest example that you can you can use. So there's an enormous amount of background internet background radiation hitting the one dot one dot one IP address that they were sort of like we can't allocate this. There's no there's no reason anybody would ever want to use it. It's just so it's basically constantly under DDoS from uh, from just the the background internet radiation and Cloudflare was. Uh, one of the organizations that in the world, one of the few that could actually, you know, that's no, no big deal to handle a bunch of unexpected traffic. So um, we made a deal with APNIC and, and uh, they're lending us the IP address for, for the, um, for this project. And, and, uh, and it's been a pretty fruitful collaboration with them so far and a really successful project. That's pretty funny. So it kind of shows off your DDoS like capabilities as well, <laughs> like, uh, protection capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one other thing we 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 should have mentioned earlier, but uh, um, I guess in your office, uh, in the uh, maybe like in the lobby or something, there's a bunch of lava lamps there, like generating entropy. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so anybody who saw the first episode of NCIS this year. Uh, might recognize they kind of stole uh, a, uh, the plot idea from from Cloudflare's office, but yeah. So we have a wall in our front lobby that has you know about a hundred lava lamps, and we record it with a with a digital recorder, and we turn that data stream into a source of random numbers that we actually you know send out to our our, our data centers and our and our servers and feed it into the as an additional uh random source so is there any academic research uh or anything like that that, that would suggest that lava lamps are actually random well lava lamps themselves uh are <laughs> are pretty unpredictable I, I i but the main thing is is, is it doesn't really matter uh <laughs> if you have a sufficiently advanced camera there's going to be enough noise in in it to to actually um to actually create enough entropy to, to to be a useful useful source um and also the lighting is also is is, is a big part of it um at any time of day you're going to have different different sources of light and uh people walking in front of the camera and uh, th- there's there's enough entropy in in like an hd hd film to 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 use for a lifetime right, right. <laughs> And I'm sure the temperature fluctuations in the room also affect the lava lamp as well. Yeah, it's very hard to predict uh, the levels of the lava lamp, but uh, it's uh, to predict everything else, all the other atmosphere conditions, basically impossible. And ev- even if they were predictable, we mix it in with other sources such as hardware random numbers. Okay, well, uh, with that, uh, Nick, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. It was a fascinating discussion and uh, I look forward to seeing what comes out of uh, Cloudflare in the future. And I think... Now uh, that things are so easy, uh, um, thanks to Cloudflare, we might l- like look into making our website uh, available like as an onion uh, domain or like available on IPFS, you know, maybe do something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, 
or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.